There we go. That better, whoa, getting a feedback. But um, really, I'm uh, so glad to be here. This church has been a special church for me um, because it has been a supporting church when I was campus pastor for the Christian Reformed Home Missions uh, for 45 years. And uh, this church was very faithful in giving and supporting in prayer and in gifts and offerings. So thank you very much. I want to especially thank the women that came up here as well. Um, we've had a rough week ourselves, my wife and I. Um, there was the woman who was the maid of honor in our marriage ceremony 56 years ago um, has had a really difficult time, she and her husband, with um, a son and that son had an up and down life and um, he spent time in prison, he abused alcohol and, and drugs but there, was, there were times of brilliance and beauty in his life. Um, I was asked to be, to officiate at his wedding and that was a, fant a wedding I'll never forget. Uh, it was held in, of all places, the rotunda of the Pennsylvania State Capitol in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And it was, there was uh, a flight of stairs and then a level spot and then another flight of stairs, just very majestic and powerful. And we stood on that level space halfway up and everybody else was down. I mean, you could not forget that kind of marriage ceremony. And we did not forget Tom. He became a friend and, and his wife, Teresa. But Tom, just last Sunday, we got a call at 7.30 in the morning. He was, we knew he was sick and it was very difficult. We had gone to Pennsylvania to see him in the hospital and uh, the call told us that Tom had died. And so Tuesday is going to be his funeral and so we're going back to Pennsylvania. But um, it's just such a, a hard thing when you go through difficulties, right? Um, and yet, um, there were, when our son was born, his life hung in the balance as well. And uh, they rushed him out of the delivery room to an incubator. And uh, that night, it was just such a hard time. And one of my friends, Dirk Artsma, a pastor of another church in Denver. I was pastor of a church in Denver, the Fairview Christian Reformed Church. He came and stood next to me in the delivery room or in the in uh, intensive care. And he said to me something you should never say to somebody in that kind of situation. He said, Ken, I know what you're going through. And I was ready to say, oh, no, you don't. But then he said because I stood next to the incubator of my first son. Then I was all ears. And all he did was quote 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the name of God our Father, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our situations so that we can be a comfort to others in their situations. Wow. What a message from God. Dirk was doing that to me from the comfort that he had received from God, his father. He now was sharing that with me. And that, I hope you'll remember that just as a, a very helpful thing that when God, when you are in difficulty, know that God is with you. The last point of my sermon is the very last promise that God gave to us. We ought to really listen to that, right? The last promise God gave to us. He said, surely I am with you 
always. Now I'm going to do something I didn't plan on doing. I want to just throw this in as well because this was such a help to me in my prayer life. I was raised with the I was raised in a Christian home and I'm just so grateful for my parents and for the Christian education that I had and I was raised with the um, habit of praying, be with me as I do this. Be with Aunt Mabel in the hospital. Be with, be with, be with. And a student said to me one time, he said, Pastor Ken, why do you pray for something that's already true? We don't have to ask God to be with us. His last promise was, surely I am with you to the end of the age. Wow, what a difference to pray. Remind me through the day that in the midst of the troubles, you're right there with me. I don't have to ask you to be with me. You're with me. Thank you, God, for being that kind of a God. Well, I, I have to get to my sermon. Um, that was not my sermon, but uh, uh, I'm wearing a button. And this is a button that every mom probably will want to get and wear. I made this myself, but uh, the button says PBP GINF WMY. And the story goes that a mom went to a mother's conference, a women's conference. And they were each given a button like this. And so when this mom came home, her little girl naturally said, Mommy, what does your button say? And she said, Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. She said, Oh, wow, I like that. Can I wear that? And the mom said, Sure, and pinned it on her little girl. She went out to play in the sandbox and, uh, of course, one of the other kids saw her button and said, uh, what does your button say? And she proudly announced, please be patient. God is not finished with my mommy yet. <laughs> and isn't that true? As we come together tonight, today, to worship God, God is not finished with any one of us yet. I think that's why he brought us here this morning, right? For us to hear something from the panel, from the songs that we sing, something that will uplift us, point us to Jesus, and give him thanks and praise. My life verse is Psalm 71. Turn that around and it becomes Psalm 71, verse 17. And this is what it says. Since my youth, O God, you have taught me. I told you already I had a Christian education and a Christian family to grow up in. And the beautiful thing is that my parents not only talked about God, but they lived it. And that's really what my sermon is about this morning. From my youth, O oh God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. That is a task all of us have the privilege to do, to declare God's marvelous deeds. Even when I'm old and gray, this is verse, seven, verse 18, Psalm 71. Even when I'm old and gray, I'm old and I would be gray if I didn't shave my head. But even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, until I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. What an opportunity we have to declare God's power to young people, to children, to those who are to come, his power and might. So uh, I invite you to take your Bibles, and I, I hope you bring your Bibles to worship. Um, it should be something that's a very special book for you that you can make notes in, you can highlight verses that God speaks to you, and it becomes very personal for you. But I'm going to first of all give my uh, introduction. Is that it? Yeah, it's up there. Good. Okay. Um, 
Some of you may remember, I don't know if it got this far north, but it certainly was in the Patterson area where we had God trucks. And uh, I was in Benigno's tire store waiting for my car to be ready. And I was also planning what I would do for a marriage ceremony that was coming up. And I thought I want to have something original and something helpful. And as I was thinking about that and praying about it, a God truck went by. Those were trucks, semis, and on the trailer, it had a huge G period, O period, D period. And it stood for guaranteed overnight delivery. And I thought, wow, God truck. I can build on that and talk about marriage from that because that has something to do with marriage. The G period could stand for God. The O period would stand for opposition from Satan. And the D period could stand for demonstrate. Here's what I shared. The marriage triangle. You know what a marriage triangle is. It, it is when a third party comes in and pulls away one of the two that are married. But this illustration works for the construction of a marriage, not the destruction of a marriage. If the marriage triangle with God is that God is at one angle of the triangle, you are at the other angle of the triangle, and your mate is at the third angle. And here's the, the insight that helps me so much. As mother and father, husband and wife, grow closer to God, who's at the third angle, they grow closer to each other. As husband and wife grow closer to God, they grow closer to each other. I love that. So this morning, I've got three points. G period, O period, D period. God, opposition, and demonstration. I want to begin with the question, what's your testimony? As you look back on your life, what has God used in your life to bring you here this morning? Who are the heroes in your life or heroines that, that you can look at and say, boy, those people really helped me think about who is God and what I should be doing and so on. Maybe it was mom and dad. Maybe it was a friend that helped you come to Christ. If it was people, thank them. If it was events changing you, I remember one event. I, I considered myself a Christian, and I was. But I, went, I was invited to go to another meeting, and they had an altar call. I was in the balcony, and I just sensed, wow, you know, God is in my heart. I believe in Jesus as my Savior. I want to declare that. So I came down from the balcony and came to the front and, and shared that not talking to the whole group, but talking to the person that uh, I met with. That was an event in my life that helped me so much to solidify the foundation that was there. How about a favorite Bible verse? I hope that because you're here, you will hear something that you say, wow, if that's in the Bible, I want to make sure I memorize that and hold on to that and share it with other people. My favorite verse in the Bible is Romans 5, verse 8. God demonstrates. Remember the D period, that's demonstrate. God demonstrates his love to us in this. And get this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Is that powerful? Wow. Wow, we were sinners. It wasn't that we were so good that, look, God, how good I am. No, we confess I'm a sinner. I need salvation. I can't get into heaven, that home that we sang about um, before. Well, helps in your testimony. I think, uh, is that coming up? Oh, let's, let's go on. 
Yeah, the three G's and the three S's. In Reformed theology, this has been such a help for me. The three G's, well, the first G starts with God. Actually, um, yeah, let's, it starts with guilt before God. And uh, that, the first S, is sin. And that's really, uh, on campus I would have opportunity so often as people, as students and faculty would stop by the table that we had with Christian literature and so on and we would start talking. So many times I would say, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I'd say to whoever I was talking with, does that include you, that all? Oh yeah. Does that include me? Sure does. And so you start out with knowing our guilt because of our sin before God. But then the next G, G period is grace, that undeserved love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that provides salvation, the second S. And then the third G is the result of the first two. If we're guilty before God and he forgives us, then we want to say thank you, gratitude. And third S is service. So gratitude in service. That's why I want to live. That's why I say I'm not retired, I'm redeployed. When you reach a certain age, you don't just stop working for God. You go on as his servant as well. And I'm so glad to share with you, one of the elders said to me, what's this on your neck? And it's a dog tag. We have, my wife and I have gotten involved with the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking. This was made by women who have been rescued from human trafficking. And the men wear a dog tag that says, not buying. Women wear a dog tag that says, not for sale. And I shared with the men in the, and women in the council room, human trafficking is the second largest global crime just behind drugs. Can you believe that? The selling of human beings, the selling and buying of human beings is the second largest global crime. And as Christians, we can respond with gratitude and service that God has freed us from the, the slavery of unforgiven sin. Well, I've got to get going here. Um, the... Uh, the second point of my sermon is opposition, right? O period stands for opposition. And I want to read something of the opposition in one of my favorite passages to preach on, and that is Matthew 28. And I'm going to begin, that's of the resurrection, but I'm going to begin with the last part of Matthew 27. The next day... This is after the crucifixion. The chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, they're talking about Jesus, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Here's O period, the opposition, right? Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on it, on, a st on the stone. I don't know if they had cement at that time, but... They used some kind of a seal to hopefully keep the stone in place so Jesus couldn't get out of it, and they posted a guard. That's the opposition to Jesus, okay? 
let's go on and uh, I'll talk about the opposition that comes in Matthew 28. We'll start at verse 11. Jesus has already broken out of the tomb, all right? He's already risen. And listen to what happens. While the women were on their way to tell the disciples, some of the guards, not all of the guards, some of the guards, maybe some of the guards became believers because of it, but some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, here's another plan of opposition, right? We're putting a seal on the stone didn't work. Here's, let's try another plan. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money. Money talks, bribery. So that'll keep Jesus from uh, doing what he's doing. Telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. What's wrong with that kind of a plan? You know what the, the result of a Roman soldier sleeping on guard? Death. So that doesn't work. Um, if this gets to the governor, don't worry, we'll satisfy him with a bribe and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Jesus rose from the dead. He overcame the opposition. He won the battle. And so we're fighting on the winning side. That's tremendous, isn't it, to know? I mean, sometimes I listen to baseball games on the radio or on, more on TV, and uh, if, if, you, if it's a game that's already been played and your team won, wow, that is just fun to watch, isn't it, rather than not knowing the outcome? And so we're fighting on that winning side. And uh, I want to end with the definition. D period e equals demonstration. I found this in verses 16 through 20. This is what God uses to overcome the opposition plan. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Jesus loved mountains. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Now, think about that. If Jesus was not God, he would have said to them, what are you doing? Don't worship me, worship God. Jesus accepted their worship. And then he said this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, because God has all authority, because he's already won the battle, he says, Go and make disciples. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always. I want to share with you a, one of the best things that has happened recently on campus. I'm not on campus anymore, but this happened just at the end of uh, my last time on campus. And it's part of making disciples. A disciple is a learner committed to his or her teacher. And so think about it in your life. Who is your teacher that has helped you grow in God? And you learned from that. You grew because of that person. They helped you through difficult times. God now calls each of us 
to be disciple makers and to have people that we disciple. Listen to this. Max is uh, a beautiful, handsome guy from Haiti. He was at William Patterson University and just was a tremendous leader on campus. Um, He and Aaron, who is Jewish, were friends for three years at high school, and both of them were on the football team. Max was the spiritual leader of the team doing the pregame prayers. At William Patterson University, the friendship continued, and spiritual seeds started to grow. Max began athlete's Bible study, and Aaron started asking questions. To find answers, Aaron started reading the Bible and began to see a pattern of Israel's rebellion in the Old Testament. His hunger for the word increased, and Max invited him to help in preparing the study. They changed the name of the football study to Fourth and Goal, All or Nothing. By this time, Aaron had received Jesus as his Messiah. Praise God. He attended Max's church and youth group, but the language barrier, it was a Haitian church, and um, brought him to an English-speaking church where he met and married a Christian young lady. They now have a son, so this is her first Mother's Day. Max told me that when he visited Aaron's family, their son, their little boy, was all excited about the story of David and Goliath. Aaron, Aaron, said to his son, be thankful to Uncle Max. Max became an uncle when, yeah, you know. Anyway, be thankful to Uncle Max because without him, you wouldn't even know about David and Goliath. Wow. Max demonstrating his love, having opposition to that, But I wrote here, praise God. And then I put P.S. Aaron suffered because of his commitment to Jesus as Lord and Savior. His grandparents abandoned him. So the opposition is there. And yet I want to urge you and encourage you to realize We are fighting on the winning side. God has gained the victory, and we celebrate that when we come together to worship him. Um, I have something here that I brought along. It's uh, something I worked long and hard on. You'll recognize it, of course. It's a chain, if you don't know. This was shown to me, and I love it, because God used people in your life ahead of you if you're at the final link of the chain. God used them to bring you to be part of the chain of serving Jesus, of learning more about him. And... uh, I really appreciated that, and I used this as an illustration probably 40 years ago in the uh, Richfield Christian Reformed Church in Clifton, New Jersey. And as I met people afterwards, as I hope I can meet you, um, a kindly old gentleman came up to me and he said, can I see that chain? I said, sure, I had it, and I held it up like this. He said, Pastor Ken, you know, you got it all wrong. Pastors don't like to hear that, right? At the the end of a sermon, you got it all wrong. I said, really? I said, what did I get wrong? All he did was take the bottom rung, which was him. He said, that's me. And what you need to do is you need to do that. I said, thank you so much. You are right. If we have received from others, we are now to make disciples of others and be the link, just as Max was the link 
to Aaron and Aaron to his sons, we now have the command from Jesus. The last command Jesus gave to us was make disciples. That is our assignment. If we name the name of Jesus as our Savior and Lord, we are to make disciples. We are to pray about who is it that God you want me to disciple. Certainly people in my family. But who else are you providing around me who are maybe newer in their faith? Or I need to learn more as, so that I can be learning as well. And I have at least two recommendations, three for you. First, that you spend time daily. I appreciated what was said by the woman sitting in this chair. I don't, I don't know your name, but you said you need to take time for yourself to make yourself whole, to catch up to yourself where God is leading you. And I would just recommend that you take your Bible and, and read at least a chapter a day and just focus in on what is God telling you Use a devotional, whatever you can use, so that you feed yourself, so that you can feed others as well. And um, that's, that's really the important thing that I want to share with you, that final command that Jesus has given. Oh, I know, I forgot the second thing about discipling. Make sure you're in a small group. It can be two, three, maybe more, where you are sharing, as the women did up here, learning from each other what they were sharing, what they were going through, and pray for them. But then the third thing is to come to worship like this, to be lifted up by the woman over here that said, I was so helped by the elders from the church coming and talking to me. Fantastic. So, the final command of Jesus, make disciples. That's our marching orders. And the final promise of Jesus, surely I am with you always. Let's pray. God, we're so grateful that we're fighting on the winning side. Thank you that you have assured us that as we go through the difficulties of life, as we mourn the death of loved ones, as we have to deal with difficult situations in our own homes, at work, wherever it is, we're so grateful that you have promised as we make disciples that you will help us, that you will be with us. Thank you for this congregation, for their constant efforts to help each other grow in you. And Lord, we pray that you will continue to expand the ministry. Thank you for the opportunities that we have. Make us aware of them and remind us, and remind us too that you're with us always. In Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen.